It's time for this week's episode of Brandon Sports Talk, featuring in-depth interviews from those who are trending in the world of athletics. And now, here's the host of Brandon Sports Talk, Brandon Pate. Welcome back to Brandon Sports Talking. Today's episode, I have the privilege to interview the Charlotte Checkers Director of Broadcast, TJ Shalot. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Brandon. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you. Can you talk about how you knew that you wanted to get started in sports broadcasting? Yeah, uh, for me, it was a very unique story. I think if you ask a lot of broadcasters like, hey, uh, when did you figure out you wanted to be a broadcaster? You know, when did you get that itch? I think a lot of them will tell you maybe, you know, as they're a a youngster playing video games and they ultimately turn down the volume and do their own play by play. Or maybe it's in middle school or high school because they're an athlete and something happens where they realize, okay, so I'm probably not going to go pro as an athlete. So let's get into the broadcasting side of things for me. It was much, much later. Um, I was selling cars from the age of 21 until I was about 29. And it wasn't until I was 29 when something happened. Broadcasting chose me. I was driving home from work one night and I heard a radio station in the local area. They were just looking for part-time, two days a week help in just producing and pushing buttons back behind the scenes. And I thought, you know what? That'd be a lot of fun. Uh, That would be a lot of neat. I I, I wouldn't mind making a little extra money and hanging around a radio station. Sounds like a lot of fun. So I applied and unfortunately I got the job that was back with ESPN radio, the Lehigh Valley in my home state of Pennsylvania. And from there, it just spiraled, you know, being and working at that uh, station, I was able to get some hosting jobs doing sports talk radio, whether it's in the afternoon or weekend mornings. And then from there, it ended up getting connections with the local AAA baseball team that was in town. And I got some studio hosting gigs and slowly but surely I built up the different skills until ultimately I tried play by play. And when I first tried play by play, I was like, this is, this is it for me because even through the first eight, nine months of working at that radio station before I ever tried out play by play, I still didn't think that was going to be my role. I thought I would just be selling cars until I retired and, you know, having this part-time gig and, and just enjoying the local radio landscape. But sure enough, play by play really latched on to me and I took it and ran with it. And that took me all over the country. And I'm so grateful to be here. Of course, what was your experience like getting to study sports broadcasting at Penn State? It was unique because of the fact that I was already immersed in the role when I went back to Penn State. So I did go to community college before I had ever started to sell cars, and I minored in radio TV, but it was a small community college. So there wasn't a lot of trial. There wasn't a lot of hands-on work. It's nothing like what the sports broadcasting collegiate curriculum is like today. It was nothing like that. I mean, you're going back to 2009, so this is... 14, 15 years ago now um, when I was doing all of that stuff. So it wasn't as fleshed out. So I had had the opportunity to get into a radio station and actually do a lot of the stuff live and for real, you know, it was very hands-on. It was me doing the job. So when I go back to Penn State and I take my mass communications class, it was very unique and very cool for me 
to be able to have the knowledge that I had already had being in the field and apply that to my studies. I can remember my speech classes, A+. plus. I mean, you're not going to really bring me down. No matter what the speech teacher wanted to say, it wasn't going to happen because clearly this is what I do for a living. And if anything, I know how to speak. That is the one thing I can come across the proper way. So like my speech classes were great. I also had a class I can remember where I had to analyze other speeches. This is a different class and I could break them down and I, I chose some hockey speeches. I chose, you know, some things that interested me from my current position. So it was very cool. You know, I didn't feel like I was picking something in the hopes that one day in the future, I might be able to get into that field. I picked stuff that related to me and I was interested in because I was already doing it right now. Of course, what was your experience like getting to be a media intern for the Lee Valley Valley? The Lehigh Valley Phantoms is really where my career started to take off. I mentioned that radio job with ESPN radio, the Lehigh Valley. That's where I got my foot in the door. And thanks to some opportunities there, doing some studio work and things, I was able to apply for an internship with the American Hockey League's Lehigh Valley Phantoms. And I worked under their voice, Bob Rotruck, for an entire season. And when I was there, that's when I really learned truly how to do hockey play-by-play. -play. Because as a producer for the radio station, I was listening to a lot of play-by-play. -play. There were so many colleges local sports teams that came through that station that I was behind the board and behind the scenes for. So I was constantly absorbing Matt Marcus, Tom Fallon, the voice of Lehigh men's and women's basketball. I was constantly listening to them. So I was absorbing a little bit, but I wasn't necessarily learning. I was just bringing everything in and hoping that maybe one day I could emulate them. But anybody will tell you, don't emulate someone else, be your own person. When I got to the Lehigh Valley Phantoms, that's where Bob really helped carve me into a hockey play-by-play -play guy because I learned the differences between cadence and the differences between speed. I learned the differences in inflection and in tone coming from him because not only did I hear him do it, much like I heard from Tom and Matt and all the other guys when I was working at the radio station, but also because he would tell me to do it when I got the opportunity to sit down and record a period or two of my demo and give it back to him for some critiques, he was the one who was there telling me, you know, don't say this, make sure you cut that out. Just be a little bit sharper here. The game is going slower here. So you can come down a little bit. You don't need to talk so fast. So he really gave me that one-on-one -on -one to help carve me into a true hockey broadcaster. How did that experience help you into then becoming a hockey broadcaster for the Mississippi River Kings? That experience, like I said, it taught me how to be a hockey broadcaster. You know, when I was working at the radio station, it just so happened that the Lehigh Valley Phantoms internship came available. And it was something that I was able to apply for. If that had been a baseball internship or a football internship, if such a thing existed, or pick a sport. I probably would have applied for it because I just wanted to, after I got that itch to do play by play, I just, I would have gravitated towards anything. It did not matter what, it, what sport it was. If I had any interest in it, if I had any knowledge of it, it didn't matter. I could watch YouTube videos. I could read about a sport. I just wanted to get my foot in the door. So once that internship came due, that kind of pointed me in the direction of hockey. And I was a hockey player in high school and it was my favorite sport. So that was kind of a, a happy little moment for me. I was like, okay, so the one sport that I'm going to follow in play by play is going to be my favorite sport. The one that I played in high school. Okay. That's, this is what we're going to do, but learning from Bob and having demos, you know, I sat at every other game. I worked with one other, I had one other colleague as an intern, Mike Zahn. He and I would alternate between who was sitting in the booth right next to Bob cutting his audio and listening to the game. And one of us would be in a different booth recording our own demo and because i had that demo and because bob continually would critique me throughout the season i had a tape at the end of all that that was i'm not going to call it perfect i was a rookie i had no idea what i was doing but so solid because it had such good teachings from someone who had been in the business for such a long time that when it came time that internship i knew was just for a season so when the season came dwindling down in april that year i knew okay hockey's my sport broadcasting is what I want to do in that sport. Let's open my eyes and see what I can do to make this full time. Let's leave my home state. 
instead of selling cars and working at a radio station or working at a radio station and being an intern, I want to go somewhere where I can do this full time and make a living. And when Mississippi came up, I saw it on a website that it was available and they were looking for someone who had all of my qualifications. Immediately, I applied. I probably applied for maybe five to 10 jobs just like that. But it just so happened that Mississippi was the fit. And that's where I ended up. And the Lehigh Valley Phantoms helped me there in that internship, because not only did I have my foot in the door, I also had a solid demo tape. So I was able to take that next step. Of course, what was your experience like getting to be the broadcaster for Mississippi River Kings? It was unique. I was only there for one season. And in fact, it was my one year anniversary with the team when we were all let know that the team was actually going to be ceasing operations and no longer existing. So that was a really tough pill to swallow. You know, I moved again. I was 29 years old at this point. I lived the first, all of those 29 years in my home state, in my hometown. I up and leave for one year. And then the team decides that they're going to go belly up. So that was hard. That was a really tough pill to swallow, but it was a very unique market. And it certainly is paying dividends now being here in Charlotte. Again, another Southern market um, in a non-traditional hockey market. I learned a lot because of the faith that David Schmall, the general manager who hired me because of the the help that I got from the head coach, Derek Landmesser and Bradley field, the interim GM who took over halfway through the season, they allowed me to run that broadcast. However, I saw fit. They let me have as long of a pregame show as I wanted, how short of a pregame show, postgame show, intermission shows. Did I want to run interviews? Did I want to do this? Did I want to do, they let me do it however I wanted to do it. It was just on me to make sure that I could execute. If I said that I wanted to have a half hour long pregame show, I better have enough content for a half hour long pregame show every single game and not get off that track. Can't all of a sudden switch it halfway through the season to a 10 minute pregame show. So they allowed me to do that. And it kind of forced me into looking at everything, the broadcast as the whole, all of a sudden, I wasn't just thinking about what I was going to say during the game and when the action was going i was thinking about everything else from you know before the game after the game getting interviews interacting with players being a part of the community getting out there and hosting and emceeing uh press conferences and things along those lines those all those duties were put on me something that i really did not have a lot of experience with before but I got the opportunity to do it and the best way sometimes in this business to try things out is to just do it And once I got out there, the River Kings really set me off on the right path. Of course, after the River Kings, what was it like going to the Austin Bruins to become the director of broadcast? Yeah, in Austin, I was there longer than than I've been anywhere else to this point. I was there for three seasons. I'm now going to begin my third season with the Charlotte Checkers coming up here. And I was only a year in Mississippi as well, but... For that, you know, the biggest thing I talk about the non-traditional markets such as Mississippi, you know, you're not thinking about hockey too much when you're in Mississippi and you're not thinking about hockey too much in, in North Carolina necessarily. When I went to Minnesota, that was the first market that truly embraced the sport. I mean, it is the home of hockey, no matter how you look at it. Minnesota is wild about their hockey even though it was necessarily, not necessarily, but even though it was sort of a step down, you know, you're going from single A pro into the junior hockey level. I did a lot of things that really, again, pushed my comfort zone. I was asked to do social media for the first time for a team. I was asked to do graphic design extensively for the first time with a team. So I had to learn those skills And at the same time, they allowed me, again, to do whatever I wanted to do with the broadcast from finding a radio station to work with and to change our radio agreement two years in um, to how long I wanted the pregame shows to what I wanted to show on video the whole nine. So it was a great experience for me. At this point, I was also in my 30s and most of the players with the Austin Bruins in the North American Hockey League, which is junior hockey, they're going to range from 18 to 21. So at this point, this was the first time that I didn't feel like I was younger than someone or that I was below them in terms of I'm just an intern. And that's, you know, a guy on an NHL contract, like it was when I was working with the Lehigh Valley Phantoms. And even when I was with the Mississippi River Kings, there was, uh, you know, there was a 
a feeling that they were the superiors and I was just the subordinate that was just, yep, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. This was the first time where you know, they're kind of yes, sir, and me kind of made me feel old, to be honest with you, because now here I am 35 and I'm even older than the guys on the AHL roster. But for me, it was the opportunity to really extend my skills beyond what I had learned in Lehigh Valley, in Mississippi, because now I'm dealing with ticketing. I'm dealing with um, even more sales. I already had the sales background, so that helped out, but I'm dealing with sales again. I'm dealing with community development. I'm dealing with graphic design. I'm dealing with video editing, all these things that I really hadn't had the opportunity to play around with, but you have to do it when you're in those levels. You got to wear all kinds of hats. So my versatility skyrocketed thanks to my time there. Of course, how did your stops along your way help you to where you are now with the Charlotte Checkers? Every single stop, I've been so fortunate to run into some fantastic people. You know, the one phrase I really don't like hearing is a self-made man or a self-made woman. I don't think there is such a thing. Uh, whether you're Mark Zuckerberg or you're Elon Musk or whoever you are, Jeff Bezos, you're not self-made because there are a hundred million people who you've come across who in one way or another have helped you or have affected your career trajectory, your life trajectory. And I'm so thankful because Bob Rochuk, if he wasn't the guy that he was, would I have been able to get that job in Mississippi with all of his help and all the offerings that he provided? If David Schmall wasn't the guy that he was in Mississippi, would I have gotten hired? And thankfully he hired me. You know, if Mike Cooper and Craig Patrick, the owners of the Austin Bruins, didn't look beyond just the play-by-play -play and they saw my sales background and didn't think that would be a fit. You know, it's one of those things where I'm so thankful for everybody that I've come across because they've helped me advance perhaps more than the actual black and white, what goes down on paper, the skills, you know, the, the bullets on the resume. Sure, they've expanded as I've gone each and every place, but at the end of the day, it's really the people. And, and that's the one thing I try to take with me everywhere I go is the amazing people who I've come across both that have had a, a direct impact on my occupation, on my job, and those that I've come in contact that have had an impact on my life from the friends that I've made in each state and the different um, just people that I've gotten the chance to interact with, the fans. And every single year, no matter where I was, I went into the upcoming season thinking, what can I improve on? What is the one area of focus? I remember when I was in Austin one year, I just sat down and I wrote everything down. I said, next year, I want to be better at this, 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 and this. So that's what I focused on. Everything I did that year, I was really sharpening my pencil to just get better at that. Same thing here in Charlotte. Last year, I wrote down what I wanted to get better at before going into the season. And I've already written down what I want to get better at going into next season um, because I feel if you're not working on yourself, you're going to get stagnant and that's when you're going to become worse off. So in terms of all those places that I've gone, it's absolutely been the people I've been so grateful and so fortunate and just blessed that they've liked me and they felt that I was a good fit and brought me on because without them, I, I wouldn't be here. Of course, as a sports broadcaster, what has it been like obviously transitioning from city to city to city to now where you are now with the Charlotte Checkers? It's tough. It is a very difficult thing um, to uproot your life and then move to a city and then have to move to another city and then have to move to another city. It's one expensive, you know, you, you start to learn to live light, right? You, you're thinking to yourself, man, I'm doing a good job here. I'm not going to be here in another year or two. So do I really want to buy that massive thing because I don't want to move it if I end up getting shipped to Alaska or if I get, you know, a job in California and I'm on the East Coast, you know, so you start to learn to travel a little bit light. Um, but it's one thing that in this industry and in this, the sports world in general, if you want to be in sports, whether you want to be a social media manager, you want to work in ticketing, you want to work in sales, broadcasting, whatever it is. You have to be willing to move many times in your career. There is not many folks who one day wake up and say, I want to be a insert sports job here. And I only want it to happen in my hometown. And there's no one that that actually happens. You know, you have to learn 
to move. You have to be willing to go to different parts of the country and you're going to be all the better for it because my travels alone have to, again, I grew up in Pennsylvania. So yeah, I knew the Northeast, New York, New Jersey, Maryland. That's all I really knew. But then when I get the job in Mississippi, now all of a sudden I'm, you know, spending time in Tennessee. I'm spending time in Mississippi. We're playing games in Alabama, Indiana, Illinois, We're all over that part of the Midwest. Then I get the job in Austin. Now we're talking a different part of the Midwest, Minnesota, Wisconsin, North Dakota, South Dakota. You get to start to see this beautiful country and you get to start to meet even more people and you're only better off. Your life just becomes enriched by being on the road and checking out these different parts of the country and becoming entrenched in the different communities in where you work. If I look at my Facebook, I can tell you right now, I probably... You know, outside of all my high school friends and the folks that know me from back home, everybody else is just folks that I've come across, fans from Mississippi, Minnesota, here in Charlotte. It's just, it's a very rewarding, rewarding thing. What was that feeling like for you to get the job at Charlotte Checkers to become their director of broadcast and media relations? It's a thrilling. I mean, I remember exactly where I was when they offered me the job. I was actually at work in Austin, Minnesota. Um, I took the call outside and I just remember just being pumped. You know, the first, the first feeling I had was okay. You know, the, look, the ultimate dream is the NHL. And, you know, for me, it's to be a play-by-play broadcaster for an NHL team or for a national network, whether it's TNT or ESPN or whoever has the rights when my time comes, if my time comes that's the dream. So when they called and they offered me knowing that I'm one step away, it it validated all my hard work that I had put forth in the previous years with the previous teams. It it made me feel a little rewarded and gratified because of my first season in just when my career got started, I thought it was going to be over because the team had folded and I'm just sitting there. I, I, I wanted to tell that TJ, like, don't worry, it'll be okay. You'll be just fine. And when they called, and gave me the offer. That was my first emotion. I was just enthralled. I was thrilled. I was everything short of, you know, jumping up and down and screaming. I was a little more composed than that, but immediately I was thrilled. And then all the questions came in. Okay. How am I going to tell Austin, you know, my, my owners, how am I going to get all my stuff there? When do they want me to start? Then it becomes all of the logistical stuff immediately came over me like, okay, we, we got work to do. If you want to be in North Carolina for the upcoming season, you got to get to work on, on moving there and getting there. Of course, what was that feeling like coming to North Carolina and being close to the Carolina Hurricanes? I, you know, it, it was nice. I mean, being anywhere in in range of an NHL team is always good for an American hockey league team. It's just, you're going to have windfall fans and it wasn't necessarily being so close to the Carolina hurricanes. It was more so the community of Charlotte. How much they have improved this market, despite it being, you know, filled with, NFL football, NBA basketball, there's a triple A baseball team. In here, the home of NASCAR, you know, all the college football that goes on and college basketball that goes on in the area. There's still such a faction of Charlotte checkers fans here that are absolutely just rabid. And it's so much fun to be working in this city. So while it was great being around an NHL city with Raleigh being just two and a half mile, uh, two and a half hours to our East, it was more the city itself because it really thrives on its own. It's, it's a wonderful spot. What was that first feeling like on game day, being in the Charlotte checkers and calling that game? I remember my first game was on the road. Uh, It was in Hershey, Pennsylvania, which is a booth that I had been in several times beforehand. Um, As an intern with the Lehigh Valley Phantoms, I used to drive to the road games that were pretty reasonably close. So anything within like two hours, which left Wilkes-Barre, Scranton, and the Hershey Bears, I would drive to those. Even though I was an unpaid intern, I just wanted more experience. I wanted to, to be involved. I wanted to see what it was like to be a guest on the road. So I was comforted in knowing that the very first place that I'm going is somewhere that I know pretty well. I knew how to get to the booth. 
I knew Zach Fish from my time as an intern in the American Hockey League, who's the voice of the Hershey Bears, which they're still going in the Calder Cup finals. They're one win away from hoisting the Calder Cup this season. But I knew Zach. I knew the lay of the land. And that was instantly comforting. But I knew I had some big shoes to fill. Jason Shia was the voice of the Charlotte Checkers before me. He had since left and gone up to the Utica Comets. And Jason was around for quite some time. He was a fan favorite. And I knew I had some big shoes to fill. I didn't want to try and be Jason part two. I wanted to be TJ. I wanted to be me. And I wanted to put myself out there. But I had an obligation to the fans because he did such a great job that I needed to make sure that I at least lived up to his level of production, his quality of his call, I needed to make sure that I was there. So I was a little overwhelmed by that. It was my first time. But you know what? It's like I said a little bit earlier in the conversation, sometimes when you have those nerves, when you have those feelings, it's just best to get in there and do it. And once the countdown hit and the pregame show start, I I just felt it like I was doing it for the millionth time. I just fell into those rhythms. It's something I've done so many times. The only thing I had to do was make sure that I wasn't calling the checkers, the Bruins, the name of my former team that I used to work for. Sometimes after three years, just saying Bruins, 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 Bruins. Yeah, sometimes that gets imprinted on your brain, but I'm happy to say that at no point did I do that through that first broadcast or ever throughout the uh, the two seasons so far. So it was um, it was definitely a nervous emotion, but I was very comfortable where I was because of the location and because of the folks that I had around. What was that feeling like the first time you got to call a home game for the Checkers? The home game, I was a little distracted because uh, I was looking around at everybody else. I was so just taken aback by by the crowd by everybody i'm just looking and i'm going this is incredible you know again i'm coming from junior hockey where riverside arena our home arena in austin minnesota on its best day would seat 2500 people you know and that is filled to the gills standing room only and here we are in bojangles coliseum which in its own right is is a monument here in the south i mean it's a historically protected building and you talk about that roof and the way it funnels sound down there were definitely some moments whether it be during a commercial or anything along those lines where i just kind of stepped back and i just i I soaked it in i really i brought it in of course can you talk about your roles as a media relations for the charlotte checkers i don't do too much media relations with the charlotte checkers paul branicky our vp of communications he and nick nijelski are uh, vp of marketing they tend to do a lot of the media relations for the team in terms of the actual back-end work communicating with the, the uh, local tv and radio outlets they do a lot of that i do do some you know it's up to me to communicate with a lot of the local radio stations when it comes to shopping the brand and maybe trying to find a full-time radio broadcast partner. We don't have one at this point, but I have reached out to several stations in the area to start up those conversations. I also, um, you know, I'll have weekly columns that I'll put out there and that end up on the website, just talking about some of the things that I saw during the last homestand or, or what have you. So I definitely get, you know, some writing in there and things like that. But a lot of the, the bulk of the busy work is handled by Paul and Nick. Those guys are absolute professionals and they take care of all of that stuff. And they let me know when they need me. Hey, TJ, you know, 6.30 in the morning, we need you to head over to the NBC station. We're going to try and pump season tickets. They want to have us on in the morning. Are you cool with doing the morning show? Absolutely. Let me know. That kind of thing. Or, hey, I got this guy that would like to come in and tour the facility and talk to the broadcaster. Can you do that? Sure thing. So it's kind of a little bit of communication that it takes between us, but always saying yes and always being someone who's available will only get you places in this industry. So anytime I had the opportunity to appear on radio or appear on TV or meet with someone, absolutely, I took it. Of course, what is the preparation like for preparing for a game day? Everybody's a little bit different. Um, My prep will start generally the day before the game. Um, You know, it's something that I learned in car sales is In that business, there's two types of operations. You have what's called fixed operations, which is your service department. They know cars are just going to come in all day 
just check them in, check them out, check them in, check them out, check them in, check them out. And then you have what's called variable operations, which is the sales side, which you don't know how many people are going to come on the lot. It's going to be one, it's going to be a hundred, it's going to be a million. So you always kind of have to be at the ready no matter what. And in the same, I take that same approach to my prep. There are certain things for a game that I know I will do every single game from watching at least a period of the team we're about to play their last game just to see if I can find any trends or if there's anything they're doing that I might want to take a look at and see if they're doing in our game to actually writing down rosters and doing all of my paperwork and my prep work in that regard. Um, But then there's other things that are a little bit more variable when is morning skate going to be? So I want to make sure that if I can get down there and get an interview or something along those lines, I need to make sure that I schedule that out. I have to work all that static stuff, all the stuff that I know I'm going to do each and every time has to now blend around that. Plus I had other duties with the team. Um, I, it's one of those things where you have, you have to do what's most important. You have to prioritize, right? So Every If you know what you have to do, if you have a list, and I'm a big list person, I always had my list. And if I knew I was going to do it, I would just try to prioritize everything, keeping the variable things, the things that might change from game in, game out. You know, if it's a Saturday, there might not be a morning skate. So I need to make sure I'm thinking ahead that if I need an interview, I'm going to have to get it before the Friday game. I'm going to have to do two, have one for Friday, one for Saturday, something along those lines. Of course, as the director of broadcast, what is that feeling like getting to interview those professional athletes after game, post or pre-game? You know, it's incredibly insightful. Yeah, when I, I've watched a lot of hockey, you know, just in my professional career. I mean, I'm approaching 400 games now, and it's one of those things where I. I think I know the game. I think I understand. But then you have a conversation with someone who has dedicated their life i mean literally their life you learn something every single time and it doesn't matter if you're talking to the you know head coach jordy kinnear who's going to be going into his eighth season as a head coach in the american hockey league or if you're talking to a rookie who's playing in his fourth or fifth game you're just going to learn something whether it's learning something about the game or learning something about who they are as a person and as a player so my you know recommendation to myself was always just Keep your eyes and ears open during those interviews because you never know what you're going to hear. And maybe it's a comment that they make that if we're in a setting like you and I are in right now where we can build off of that and make the interview a little bit better, or maybe it's something you just want to kind of put in the back of your mind. And then during the broadcast, you know, oh yeah, you know, in talking with head coach Kinnear earlier today, he did mention this is a team that is really fast. So they're going to try and clog him up in the neutral zone. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, there you go. So when it happens, you can make that comment and you're instantly fleshing out that broadcast. Of course, what are some of your favorite memories and moments covering the checkers? I think it's a little bit of recency bias. Uh, some of my favorite memories, um, in terms of on, you know, cause there's, there's two, there's two lives. When you work with a sports team, you have two lives, you have your front office life. And then of course you have your in-game life. And if we're talking about memories in game, it's the overtime winners. And again, recency bias, uh, just this past series against the Hershey bears or excuse me, against the Lehigh Valley Phantoms in round number one of the Calder cup playoffs this season, the checkers were, it was game two best of three series. They were behind They were on the brink of elimination, ended up tying the game. They force it into overtime. Nothing gets done in overtime. Second overtime rolls around. One minute left to go in second overtime. And they end up getting a goal from Lucas Carlson, which I was ecstatic. Uh, My call was just short because I just wanted to take the moment in. All I said after that puck at the back of the net was just, we're back tomorrow night because we had forced a game three. The team wasn't out just yet. And that moment was just something that I honestly, I stand up when I call my, when I call the games, um, unless I'm looking for a change, like a little, if we need a rally or something, I might sit down. I might change things up a little bit, just seeing if that helps any, a little superstitious. Um, I was standing up in that moment and I just, I just slumped back in my chair, still on the air and, and just, just let the crowd go. 
You know, it was such an exciting moment to have that happen at Bojangles Coliseum. But there's been so many other incredible moments from Zach Dalpy scoring an overtime winner, his second goal of the game up in Utica uh, in a game where they were just absolutely having their way with the checkers physically. I mean, they're big guys like Kevin Ball, who's now in the NHL with the New Jersey Devils. He's six foot eight and he's just throwing guys around like rag dolls. And the checkers just look so beat down, but they were never out of it. And for Zach Dalpy, the team captain, one of the older guys on the team, to find the back of the net for the second time in the game and win it in overtime, it was just an exciting and incredible moment. And to do it on the road and to quiet that house that was so raucous, that was so just lively to just, it was incredible. And of course, I would I would always, you know, point to my first game, which we talked about a little bit at Bojangles Coliseum, my first game as the voice of the checkers in Hershey, those are moments that I won't be forgetting anytime soon. And of course you do remember some of the losses too. Of course, what has it been like, obviously getting to call against games like the main Marlins? Well, I've never had the chance to to call games against the main Mariners. They're in the ECHL. So they're actually um, one step below the Charlotte checkers, but I do know their radio guy very well. That's Michael Keeley. He was actually the voice of the Austin Bruins before I got there. So I had the chance to meet him one day and then he took off and he took his job in the ECHL with the main Mariners. And then I ended up getting the job in Charlotte. So I've never had the chance to call games against them, but there are some really historic teams in the American hockey league. We talked at nauseum. I feel like this is a Hershey bears podcast, but we talked about the bears. They're the oldest franchise in the American hockey league. You know, you talk about even some of the new ones, the Coachella Valley firebirds they're in their very first season this year. Half of the players on that team were with the Charlotte Checkers last year. We had a shared affiliation between the Seattle Kraken and the Florida Panthers. So a lot of those guys I remember interviewing when they were right here in Charlotte. Now they're out there. And, you know, to see these guys get the chance up at the NHL level, you know, our captain Zach Dalpy spent the entire postseason run for the Florida Panthers into the Stanley Cup finals. You know, to see that, to see guys like Alex Lyon, it's it's very rewarding. It's very, very cool. But the American Hockey League just has some storied franchises, some storied buildings. I can think of going up to Hartford, Connecticut to take on the Hartford Wolfpack, and that's the XL Center. You know, that's where the Hartford Whalers, the NHL team, that's what they used to call home. That is their barn. I am calling games from the same location as John Forsland when he got his start way, way back in the day before the ultimately the Whalers moved down to become the Hurricanes. And, of course, Forsland moves on to go be the voice of the Seattle Kraken. So the American Hockey League is just full of rich, rich history, some great barns, some great stories, and incredible players have come through. What are some of your notable catchphrases that you use for the checkers game? I do my best to not have any noticeable catchphrases. I know a lot of baseball guys tend to call a home run the same way. I grew up as a Philadelphia Phillies fan, so I know Harry Callis, you know, it's out of here. That was his thing. But you can only say stuff so many different ways, right? I I think a good broadcaster will paint the picture that's going on in front of you and vary everything up as much as they can. But you can only say the puck is in the corner so many times, you know, there's only so many ways you can describe that. So you do find yourself repeating a little bit. And I have been uh, ribbed a little bit that I say in the trapezoid, perhaps a little too much throughout the course of a game. Of course, the trapezoid, the area behind the net where goaltenders can play the puck, they're not allowed to play it outside of the red lines that come out from the goal line. And um, I've had some members of front offices of the front office. As a matter of fact, it was last season. I came in after a game and I'm looking at the floor and they had taped near my desk a trapezoid, you know, so that I was working in the trapezoid. So I've heard that I have said that a little too frequently and I'm trying to cut that back. But again, you can only say behind the net so many times, behind the net, behind the pipes, in the trapezoid, you know, behind the cage. There's only so many, uh, eventually throughout the course of a game, especially with how much the puck ends up, you know, behind the goal line, behind the net. There's only so many ways you can say it. So, you know, maybe one or two times I leaned a little too heavily on trapezoid. So they they made fun of me in a very lighthearted manner. And I was very appreciative of it. And even to this day, we would go on to name my weekly article 
in the trapezoid with TJ. So it just kind of became a uh, a cool little trend there. But I don't think I have too many catchphrases. Being a director of broadcast, what has that been like, obviously, getting to work with the media to bring coverage to the Charlotte Checkers? Yeah, I mean, as the director of broadcasting, my job is to not only do play-by-play and make sure that we have a great product that's out there, but it's also to find different ways that we can get that broadcast out there. You know, whether it's um, tying everything through our app and our internet radio station to making sure that AHL TV, our web stream is up and running and that we have audio and that there's no issues there. So there's a lot of technical aspects to it. And it's really fun because like you said, then you get the opportunity to go out and start talking to media when we're in the playoffs and we have the different TV stations coming to the game uh, you know, early and they're doing their live six o'clock news hits from inside the Coliseum right before puck drop. It's, it's just exhilarating. It's great to go talk with those guys and to kind of be the center of attention. I, I said this a little earlier, I would never say no. Whenever Nick or Paul would come up to me and say, Hey, we've got a uh, TV show. We need you there at this time. Can you do it? Absolutely. As long as everybody in the office is okay with me being out of the office, if it's through office hours, I'm there, I'm your guy. I liked doing it. I liked saying yes, but it was more so because I liked interacting with the fans via TV, via radio. I would go on radio shows. I'd appear on podcasts, no matter what it was. If somebody wanted to talk Charlotte Checkers, I'm there. You just have to let me know. And I'm there because I like doing it. It kind of feeds the ego just just a little bit. And all of us radio guys, we all have an ego, just some bigger than others, but we all have one. Have you been able to balance your life as the director of broadcast with your life outside of hockey? Well, it's tough. It's always tough to balance work life, right? Like work life balance is something that you don't need to be, you know, working for the Charlotte checkers to struggle with that. You could be working wherever you're working. It's always something they have to do. But again, I am so fortunate that this team is so considerate of the work-life balance. So we will get work from home days throughout the week during the season. We'll also get them during the uh, off season as well. We'll get some extended time off just to kind of recoup because it is a long season. When you're talking about from October until April, May, whenever your season is done, there's a lot of hours. We talk about that prep, you know, Watching that game, you know, going back and watching the Hershey Bears last game or or watching at least a period of their game, that's not something I could do in the office. That was something I was doing on my own time. I was sitting here in the office and I'm playing it on my computer screen and I'm taking notes. You know, it's kind of like being in school, right? Like you have homework and it's simply a long season. And because of all those hours that you put in that you don't get necessarily paid for, you know, it's not like I could go back to my boss and say, hey, I was up until three o'clock last night watching that Hershey game. I need you to make sure you pay me for that. It doesn't work that way. You're, I'm doing that because I want to have the best possible broadcast I can. Because if I went in there and I said, hey, you guys got to pay me for the three hours you know, that I watched that entire game, they'll go, well, just next time, don't do it because we don't care. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing it for the fans and for the broadcast. So I sound like I've been keeping up with the team because it, it is hard to keep up with 31 other teams in the AHL. But that's the way that I can do it before a broadcast. So bottom line, I'm just so fortunate because this organization really does care about the work-life balance. Uh, They treat us so well in terms of uh, just time off and making sure that we can balance just the incredible working in sports is just so, so busy and so streaky. There are going to be months where you are incredibly busy weeks where you're incredibly busy and then all of a sudden you might just go flat for a couple of weeks while the team's on the road or something along those lines. And then they come back and it's like, boom, okay, we're right back into it. So the Charlotte checkers have been so fantastic in that. What are some of the things that you learned now that you didn't know before becoming a director of broadcasts? Oh boy. How much time do we have? <laughs> uh, a lot of the things, you know, it, going back to my time in Austin, it, it was the things like video editing, it was the things like uh, social media. You know, I didn't know how to run a social media account for a team until I landed in Austin. Graphic design, stuff like that. It, it was a need that the team had and they asked me to fill. So I went out, I took my online classes, I got online certifications in graphic design and 
you know, bought the programs and did all that stuff. So I had to, I had to make sure that I went that extra mile to make sure that I could do the job. Otherwise they would find someone who would say, and I didn't want that to happen. I wanted to be that guy. Um, but you also learn that it's not always managing the job. You know, you're not always managing the broadcast. You're not always managing the audio levels or the graphic design or the social media numbers. It's, it, it's not all of that. It's just managing the people. If you can manage your fans, if you're in sales, if you can manage your clients and you can make them feel like friends and, and a lot of them become friends, I'll be honest with you. If you can manage that, everything else will fall into place as long as you work hard at it. And that's pretty much the one thing that I've learned throughout my entire broadcasting career, because this is so unique. It's such a different job. The hours are weird. The schedule is weird. My summers are light. My winters are incredibly busy. Forget it. Sometimes I can't go to holidays. I can't go to Thanksgiving. Can't go to Christmas. We've got this. We've got that. Whatever it might be, that stuff's really crazy. And the one thing I've learned is just manage your relationships, manage the people, and everything else will fall into place. What advice would you give people looking to become sports broadcasters? Uh, very easy. Very, very easy. Keep your eyes and your mouth open. And when I mean by that is always be on the lookout for opportunities. If it's an opportunity that you see that you're interested in and maybe you don't 100% fit the qualifications, so what? Go for it. Just like me in Austin. I didn't know how to do graphic design, but it was something they asked me to do when I got there. So I did it. I took over and boom, it, you learn. Number one, keep your eyes open because you always have to be on the lookout for something. Because if you want it, you got to look for it. It's not going to come knocking on your door and say, hey, we're here. That's not the way it works. Always keep your eyes open and always keep your mouth open too. speak up for those jobs. If you want it, go for it. Make sure that you apply, do everything that they ask you to do and go after it. And also in terms of keeping your mouth open, keep practicing, keep getting your reps, making sure that you're watching whatever the sport is you want to get into. Let's use hockey as an example. Keep watching hockey games. Keep doing demos of hockey games. I, I, I'm practicing right now. I'm going back and watching some of those games that the Checkers had earlier this year, and I'm listening to myself and critiquing myself and getting ready to be even better next season. You can do that right now, even if you don't have a, a gig. Even if you're not with the team like I am fortunate enough to be with, you can still pretend like you are and keep practicing so keep your eyes and your mouth open those are the things that are going to get you there with your eyes open you'll find something with your mouth open you're going to be able to speak up for it and you're going to be able to go after it and with your mouth open by practicing by talking by doing a lot of stuff like this you're going to be in the best position to get that job when it does come available that's great advice where can my listeners find you at on social media along with the charlotte checker set um, I'm very active on Twitter. I say very active. I'm pretty active on Twitter at TJ underscore Shalot. You can also follow the Charlotte Checkers there on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. Just search Charlotte Checkers. You'll find them. They're going to be the top hit. I do always recommend this. Always type in Charlotte Checkers because if you just type in Checkers, you're going to get a lot of King Me Checkers type stuff. So Charlotte Checkers, they're everywhere. Follow me. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter, TJ underscore Shalot, C-H-I-L-L-O-T. That's chill out without the U. Thank you again, TJ Shalot, for your interview and best of luck in your future at Charlotte Checkers as the director of broadcast. Brandon, thanks again for having me. This was a great time. Thank you. You can find Brandon Sports Talk on Instagram at Brandon Sports Talk, Twitter at Talk underscore Brandon, and you can find me on YouTube at Brandon Sports Talk. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you again, TJ Shalot, for your interview, and best of luck in your future. Thanks, Brandon. You've been watching Brandon Sports Talk. Please feel free to like, share, and subscribe to Brandon Sports Talk on social media and on YouTube.